Kudu TV, everything poiky with Stephen Horn. You are now live. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Welcome to the first edition of Kudu TV. Uh, this is going to be a, a program that we're going to work on throughout the year and years to come where we're going to be doing a variety of things, but um, we wanted to start off with four episodes in August. So we've got today, the 8th, we're going to be focusing on the poiky, aka the Dutch oven. Um, that we offer here. Um, then on the 15th, we're going to be coming to you from Atlanta, focusing on the Kudu Rotisserie with Shia LaVie. Um, we'll be back here on the 22nd, um, working on the smoker lid and talking about the various ways to, to smoke on the Kudu. Um, and then lastly, on the 29th, we're going to be uh, focusing on the cast iron skillet and the plancha um, with our friend Lynn Wells from North Carolina. So after that, who knows where Kudu TV will take us, but uh, we're very excited about it. And we're excited about talking with folks that are interested like we are in bringing people together around food and fire. So um, let's start off with my guest here, Chris Bowles, the, AKA the Kudu Bromaster. It's a promotion from Brymaster. <laughs> and so he's doing a variety of things here today. We've got four dishes uh, that we're gonna just be talking about that we've worked on for today. We've got a traditional South African poiki cost, which I'm excited to show you guys. Um, Chris has made some risotto that he's going to talk to you about. I've done a dessert of a peach cobbler that's a super easy dish that you can do just about anywhere, particularly when you're camping. Um, and then Chris is actually fish, uh, finishing off a dish that he's he's gotten going. So Chris, tell us a little bit about this last dish that we're going to focus on. This is basically a, a, a tapa. Uh, it's a uh, called Seafood Mozambique. Uh, it's got a coconut broth and some other spices. Obviously, we've got some uh, blackening seasoning. Hat tip to this, uh, the, the Spiceology mix. Um, we'll be putting some Sazon in there, my new secret spice, and make the sauce in here, and then we'll put, put it together with the seafood that's been blackening right here on the grill. So you may hear some thunder in the background. Uh, we're in the south in, in Georgia, and it's not only very hot and humid, but we've got storms rolling through, so hopefully we can get through all this without any problems. So let's talk about the poiki. Um, this is a traditional South African Dutch oven. You'll notice that it's a rounded pot with longer legs than what you might be accustomed to in Dutch ovens from America. Um, the history of the Dutch oven um, really started back in the Iron Age, and, and they were actually making um, a variety of casting pots for, for various purposes. Um, but it really wasn't until um, later in the 1500s that they really started to focus on the, the cooking qualities of cast iron. Um, and then the Dutch brought this down to South Africa in the mid 1600s. And from there, um, the Voortrekkers, as they were known, uh, African descendants, took this north into Africa and this became a very popular cooking item um, and so I was exposed to it uh, you know through my wife and, and how they they cook and they love to use this apparatus they use it all the time and it can do so many things um, so this is what you would find typically in South Africa if you you know know anything about the kudu poiki we have upgraded that significantly to a nice enameled finish it's all cast iron still but it is a beautiful piece of cooking equipment that not only can you use it outside on the kudu but you can use it inside. So if you've got a gas range or anything like that, you're going to find that you're cooking with this pot all the time, whether it's in the oven or on top of the range or out here on the kudu grill. So Chris, what are some of the things that you really like about uh, poiki cooking, Dutch oven cooking? Well, I also want to point out that Paul Revere had his hand in bringing the poiki to what we understand now. Uh, no. Yeah, Paul Revere. Well, he's from America. America. He, uh, <laughs> He didn't, this happened in 1650. Paul so. Revere's a badass, I'm telling you. He could do anything. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, we're, but, we're but just, Paul I'm Levere's American actually, as, as apple pie, but I'm just going to leave that right there. We know that. Uh, Paul Revere's credited for the lip right here so that you'll notice the uh, the cobbler that's cooking down down below Which holding holding the charcoal on top. That was Paul Revere. Okay. Uh, so. So how do you like to start with with this particular dish that you're doing? This this dish is it's an easy dish. I mean, and, and I think when uh, when we were talking about getting stuff together, we wanted something that is easy and repeatable. Uh, I put butter in here, and then some onions, and then garlic right there at the end. And as you saw as we were talking, 
Uh, I've added my coconut milk and some hot sauce. Now about to add the secret sauce here, the sazon, and I'm gonna stir it and it's gonna be done. Uh, that's that's how easy this sauce is. And then all we're gonna be doing is be waiting for the, the seafood to cook. So you'll see me moving that around. I got some okra on there and some shishito peppers just cause I like shishito peppers. It's just one of these things, whatever you can dream up and find and you wanna combine it with, do it. We've done it with, uh, in my family, we've done it with fish. Uh, we put it over pasta. We've just served it in a little, uh, in just a little dish, in a little ramekin dish with just one, just like with shrimp or whatever we can find, mussels. Um, it's just a versatile, you know, be-all sauce, and it's just very unique, uh, very different, and it'll impress people. Sure. So, you know, what's neat about the, the, the Dutch oven in and of itself is that it, it, it can do so many things. For starters, it is truly an oven. Like, you can bake in it. Um, you can do bread in... Um, a Dutch oven. You can do casseroles in the Dutch oven. And, and when you're focusing on something like that where you actually are wanting to bake, the rule of thumb is pretty much two to one. So you want twice as many char as much heat and charcoal on top of the um, apparatus as you have beneath it. So that's really important to think about. So if you're baking, you're going to have, if you've got eight pieces of charcoal underneath, you're going to have at least 16 over top. So that heat can really get down and provide an even bake for it. But you can also do low and slow. People do chili um, in, in the poiki. They, they do um, stews like we're doing here with this poiki cost, which we're gonna talk about here. You can deep fry in this product very safely. So if you've got this over the fire and you're you know doing some sort of fried food, it'll be a very safe way for you to do that. And then you can do more complicated styles of cooking like braising and, and other things, Chris. What are um, other things that you've done with it? Um, I've fried in it. Um... I've certainly made this risotto right here. Um, yeah, just rice or grits or, you know, and when you're doing breakfast, and you know, you can... Egg bake, you know, you take your bread and you soak it in, uh, in, in the milk and the eggs overnight with some other ingredients as well. Throw it on there. Um, we've, uh, we've done all kinds of soups on there. Um, during Thanksgiving, it's a tradition now, with my family, we make something on the Wednesday night. We go out to this bridge, on, and it's all decked out. It's an unused bridge. And I cooked for a big family, probably about 20 of us, on one kudu. And one of the things that's become the new cool thing for us to do for the last few years is I get Georgia Saplo clams and get a big bag of those clams. And I make a white wine uh, butter sauce, and, you know, shallots and things like that. Put the clams in there, and that's kind of the appetizer while I'm cooking other things. People just go wild over it. We get crusty bread, they're dipping it in there. We just take the poiki directly from where we're cooking and then it goes on the table, obviously on a pan, so we don't burn anything, but I mean, people just go after it. It becomes the, the, the serving dish, actually. No. Um, so, and and I've seen them also where we're just that, you know, you're out in the woods, so you can just sit there and cook on it. You know, you don't need to have a kudu grill necessarily to cook on it. It just needs, you put it in the fire. No, like, you, you probably need a kudu grill. You need a kudu grill. So, anyway. But, <laughs> but look how it's cooking here. You know, to start this off, I had I had to pull the coals out um, from there and put it underneath here, and now I want to slow the cooking. I just move the coals away. That's it. That's right. Is that simple? So let's talk about the porky cost. So this is a traditional South African stew, um, and it's it's a really simple dish. I'm going to come grab the camera and and bring it up here for you guys to get a better look at. Just one second. All right. You guys are with me here. So here is the finished result of a pulky cost. And what's nice about this, this is a stew that is layered and you never touch it while you cook on it. So well, you're gonna start by just browning some onions in some oil and you're gonna keep that in the bottom of your poiki, your Dutch oven. And then I've got um, spare, uh, I've got short ribs in here, um, but you can do lamb neck, you can do um, oxtail, uh, very, very popular item. So um, you'll brown that next and you'll layer that in and then you'll cover that just to the top of the meat with beef broth. After that, you, you keep it low and slow for hours and you start in by laying your harder vegetables like potatoes. Um, we've got some um, pumpkin in here. And then towards the top, now that you've seen this, you've got some carrots and some mushrooms. And that kind of steams at the top and then all these flavors come together so nice. So um, 
this is an example of what we've done just with one Dutch oven that this amount of um, stew would feed easily 10 to 15 people. So if we want to go over here, uh, Chris, to your, to, to your risotto, talk about the risotto and, and how you've done this and um, talk us through it. You know, oh, that looks great. The risotto is one of those things that it does take, it's not hard to do, it, but it is a little timely to do. You've got to keep stirring. So what I usually do is I'll have a pan, just a regular kitchen pan or another poiki if I have one, of broth with saffron that I've crumbled up in there. Oh, with saffron that I've crumbled up in there. <laughs> and I have a ladle and I'm bringing it back into the poiki. So I start off with, with, with the uh, shallots, um, butter uh, and, and, and olive oil and, then, and garlic and then come in there with the rice, a little bit of wine. And then I'm just slowly adding the broth to the arborio rice. It's important which rice you use. You do need to use the short uh, starchy grains. And then it's just a matter of stirring. You're just always adding liquid when it dries up, add some more liquid, and you're keeping on stirring. And then probably towards the end, that's when the, a good quality Parmesan cheese goes in. And I always leave like at least one more, one more serving of, of the broth to go in at the end, just to mainly finish it out and get it a nice creamy uh, risotto. That's really the, the important thing is it needs to be stirred to bring out all the starches. That's right. So one of the really easy uh, things that you'll see people do with a poiki is they, they might start a dish or they might cook rice in it or they may do something with it and then they'll move it out of the kudu base or off of um, the, the Dutch oven hanger and they'll move it to the ground. Oftentimes I like to bring it down here and I'll finish it here, but this is the cobbler that we did. Take a look at this. I mean, that is just absolutely beautiful. This is such a simple recipe that you can do. You add some, you know, ice cream with this and the kids will go absolutely crazy. So all this is, is canned peaches from the grocery store um, in heavy syrup. So you want to get the ones with heavy syrup. You just pour those in the bottom and then you take regular cake mix and you simply just cover all the peaches where it's about half an inch thick or an inch thick. And then you just cube up butter and spread the butter all around and then you simply add the charcoal to the top twice as much as you do the bottom and give it about, mm, I don't know, 45 minutes and you're ready to go. I mean, that is just absolutely beautiful. So Chris, what we got going on here with your with your dish? Stebbin, we're done. Uh, I'm just taking everything and I'm getting it into the broth. I'm gonna give it a little bit of a stir and it's ready, ready to eat. It's all good. Take a look at that, That's some beautiful color. So go back through everything that's in this dish. All right, so started with the with the butter, onions, garlic. Then we came in with the coconut milk. It came in with, and the recipe calls for a, a vinegar, your favorite vinegar-based hot sauce. I just happened to use uh, this one right here, Valentina. And then, I, and then at the very end, I came in for one can of coconut milk, two packets of this Goya Sazon, of course. I did a good job ripping the uh, the name off it, but it's Goya Sazon. You can get it in, in, in most Spanish or uh, Hispanic stores, ordered online from uh, wherever you order stuff. Chris, talk about the fact that you've been able to do both the grill and the Dutch oven at the same time, and you've been able to raise this to a height that you were totally in control while you took, say, tender vegetables like this, and you just got that perfect finish on them. Well, not only that, Stebbin, I was able to control not only the heat on my vegetables and my seafood, but while we were talking earlier, I was also controlling the heat on my poiki as I was moving the coals away. Right. So when I started up, I brought the coals in. I had a coal pan, brought the coals in, got the butter going, started my mirepoix saute. And I said earlier my, my height here on where I was going to uh, need to be, but I've been able to control heat on two different things. I basically have two heat zones and really turn this one into a third heat zone by moving things around right so i'm not constrained it's not one time i do it i'm done i gotta keep i'm able to keep moving the heat around basically to meet what i'm doing that's right and i think that's an important point is that the, the kudu is unique and one that it's 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 countertop height, so you're not bending over. If you're having to bend over to cook all the time, that's gonna get really old really fast, period. On top of the fact that it's countertop height, it's also shallow.
So if you want to cook just a small meal for someone quickly on a weeknight because you're in the middle of the work week and you want to throw a couple chicken breasts together and some vegetables, you can come out here and be done in less than 40 minutes and you've got a meal. Or if it's a big gathering, look at all the stuff that we're doing here and just imagine if you had steaks or burgers or doing french fries and this is an appetizer at my house this is yeah. not the main meal this is an appetizer so you know you could just do so many things and that's what's so neat about the the kudu cooking system is that it truly is a system that allows you to do so many things and the fact that it has a flat bottom uh it allows you to bank your coals and not all the coal is concentrated in the middle like most grills providing one heat source so we've got a question so we got more of a comment. Scott Kraft said he just ordered his kudu and is anxiously awaiting for the arrival. Can't wait to put the grill through its paces. Stebbin, tell him how to break in the kudu. Oh, man. So there's so many fun ways to break in the kudu. I don't know what your favorite dish is, but one thing that I hear from people all the time is that um, tender proteins, your chickens, your fishes, your vegetables, the flavor that comes off this grill is unmatched um in fact you you were telling me a story not long ago about your family and how much they love kudu vegetables i have five children and typically i you know i like to cook their birthday meal and anytime i ask them what they want to eat one thing they always request is kudu vegetables and it's that was the most surprising thing for me starting to cook here and it's just whatever in season vegetables i can get chopped up cooked on here and just enough smoke gets in there and it flavors it in such a great way and again take this yeah. straight to the serving you know, on the stove and for me we're not even using this right right now. but and what's what what Chris has told me and, and others is the fact that when you cook even if you're cooking on the cast iron skillet and you're doing vegetables you actually still get that smoky flavor so it's coming in and penetrating that food even though it's not directly like a grill where it's getting all that smoke and I've even tried doing the pan, the same plancha in the oven and making the same thing, and it doesn't taste the same. And I can't explain it except for the smoke, obviously. Yeah. So, all right, Tina, we got another question? Yeah. Uh, so, Social Animal says, What is your favorite recipe with the poiki? Wow. It would probably be the, the poiki cost because this is my wife's, uh, you know, chicken noodle soup. This is her American pie. When South Africans get together, um, this dish is so prominent. It is so prominent that they, like we have barbecue challenges and cook-offs and things of that nature, Boston butt competition. They have poiki cost competitions. I went to a high school event for one of my nephews and they had their main stadium, their main rugby field, what was dug up with dirt and had charcoal all over it with 200 Poikies, they were competing. Could you imagine going to a high school in America and they have gone onto your main football field and dug it up and put charcoal in there for you to cook Boston butts? I mean, they are crazy about this stuff and it's such a fun, simple way to do. It's low and slow. You can come out and add a few coals to the fire and keep it bubbling all day and you're never having to stir it. You're never having to do anything too complicated and the flavor that comes from that is really tremendous. I gave um, Chris a little sample of it earlier and you just talked about how unique that flavor was. Yeah, I've never, I, the, the flavor is, is was surprisingly different. I'd also like, I know Seven just said his favorite one, I've done a milk braised pork shoulder in the poiki and mm -hmm. with some lemon zest. It's a northern Italian dish and it's a basically a, a braise and it's delicious. It's really good. Yeah. All right, Tina, what you got? So, next question, I want to brown some beef for stew. Should I do it in the pot or in the skillet first and then add to the pot for deglazing the skillet? Well, that, that's a good question. I mean, if you're, do, if you're gonna ultimately deglaze, you're gonna have to, to remove it and then add back what would happen in a poke cost. They'll actually do their onions in hot oil first and then they will brown their beef in there and then they'll just pour the um, you know the stock or whatever they're using back on top of it, and then add the onions back. So a lot of know. different dishes. Like if you think of uh, a Spanish um, paella, they go in and they actually brown their meats first in their in their paella pan. Then they remove it. Then they come in with their sofrito, their their mirepoix, and they're using that oil. They add a little olive oil if there's not enough. So they're deglazing using their their aromatics 
So I think it should be a one pot, just so you don't miss any of the meat. What what you got going on there? Uh, I have an amazing seamstress. Uh, <laughs> the last episode of Kudu Nation we did, I bent over and uh, this shrank. It's been very humid in making. Yeah, that's right. And, uh, no one's growing. It's, it's just this shrinking. shrank and I bent over and it popped in my sweet uh, lady sewed my bandana. Yeah, it's good patchwork. Thank you. Tino. Stevan, Tanya wants to know, what is your secret ingredient in your chili recipe? Oh, goodness. I can tell you, Tanya. It can't be a Tanya, secret. Re- it can't, if well, it's a secret, yeah. There is a, there's one single ingredient that sets it apart from, from others, and people that have had it have commented on that. So maybe maybe if we can keep growing Kudu TV and uh, we get a big following, I'll let that one out of the bag for everybody. Okay, so, all right, I'll move that for you. There you go. So let's talk about the strength of the Kudu Grill. We have no less than, you know, two, one, two, three, these are, these are all, you know, 20 pounds with, with the food in it. We've got, we've had food on here. We've got a cast iron skillet. The Kudu is so strong. It may look simple um, by design, but it can handle any load. We remember when we were at Lambstock and those guys were boiling those, um, I don't know how many gallons of water they were cooking on one kudu, but it was incredible. Yeah. And they were like just shocked at how much you can put at this cooking system and that it just absolutely will not fail you. But you got to balance it. So look, we're not going to pretend like, you know, I can, you know, hang, you know, our Dodge Ram pickup over here on the side. It does need to be balanced. Uh, it will flip over if you put everything on one side. That's right. So just like any other thing, you'll, you know, have to be mindful of, of where the center weight is. Yeah, Tino. All right, so we got another uh, poiky question. Back to the uh, cobbler. Okay. So how long do you cook the cobbler? Yeah, so it takes around 45 minutes. Um, You will actually um, see the butter will melt into the cake batter while the syrup from the peaches comes up, and then it'll start to brown. And that'll just be your indication that um, it's getting, you know, ready to be taken off the heat. One of the things you'll really need to monitor, if you feel like the top of it is cooking faster than the fact that it's cooking through, then you're going to want to move, remove some of the coal from the top and allow that even baking to, to take place. But it shouldn't take you more than about 45 minutes, and it's a, such an easy thing. Literally, you take a can of um, whatever fruit you want. I chose peaches and that um, thick syrup, one thing of uh, cake batter and then some butter and you can take that with you wherever you want and it produces a beautiful dessert that's really easy and uh, people really love it think about the tailgate i was just thinking just now you know someone says hey can i bring something to the tailgate someone else has already got a grill there maybe they've got their cootie there you show up with your with your poiki and place it out on their fire and make this 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 cobbler dish i mean that's incredible that's right nobody's doing that and it's not, and, and this is, you know, everybody loves La Crusade, uh, those beautiful, you know, nice enameled cast iron pieces of cookery. This not only goes along with that, but it can do so much more. And, and you can either, you know, use it inside, use it in the oven, use it out here on your kudu, use it by itself with just charcoal. I mean, really, it's, it's a beautiful piece of equipment. Um, yeah, Tino. So, uh, could you cook... Could you do lamb, lamb shanks in the Dutch oven? And if so, how would you do it? I would, I would consider uh, it's obviously a, a tougher meat like that. It's going to call for a braise. That's right. So I'd, I'd go ahead and, and brown it first, remove it, put in my aromatics, um, you know, the onion, the garlic, maybe even consider um, some fennel bulb or something like that. But uh, you know, but but get it Similar good and hot. Exactly. Right. Get yeah. it get it good and hot. Brown your meat, remove it, uh, and then bring it back when you're deglazing all of that. And uh, you know, maybe even a wine with some beef broth or chicken broth if you want it lighter. It makes sort of a lamb asabuco sort of uh, situation. Um, at the end, come in with some uh, root vegetables. Um, you know, let those cook maybe for 20 minutes or less. And there you've got a, a wonderful hearty. Yeah, and soup. you could be doing your root vegetables on your plancha or your cast iron skillet while you're doing the rest of that, and the beef can kind of stand alone or, or however you want to do it. So. And a bouquet garni, you know, put some sort of 
herbs like a you know thyme, bay leaf, uh, rosemary, that kind of thing in a satchel or tie it up or just throw it in there if you don't and, mind. And this is something I want to bring up because we, we talk about fuel all the time. What kind of fuel do I use? What do you like best? What's this and the other? Everybody knows I love a premium lump charcoal. I'm going to spend extra money to get the very best quality charcoal and then I'm going to use the smoker lid to shut that down and I can save it and reuse it the next time. But there's no doubt that charcoal briquettes provide the most even temperature and they work really well when you're using a Dutch oven because they're easy, they're, they're consistent. Smaller, and they're good, um, yeah. So you can put them around the top. So we've, we've done that today where typically I'd be using a mixture of lump charcoal and wood and that was something you were talking about earlier is that the kudu is so different in the fact that it can use both at the same time and most grills have a specific fuel requirement. Yeah, a lot of times I'll just, uh, especially if I've got some you know cool wood with me, I'll come over and and um, start it with just a little bit of charcoal and do my rest of my cooking on wood, mostly from a cool factor, honestly, and especially when it's in the fall, um, you know, season. I really, the thing that really sold me on the kudu, especially in the colder weather, is after I'm done cooking. Of course, everyone's kind of standing around looking at the thing. And ask me what we're doing and all that stuff so it's a social way to cook but then the coolest thing the thing I love the most about it is when it's all over we've eaten we've come back out and before I've got off cooking I put some logs in there well now we've got a whole other activity and we've got a fire pit and we're gonna stand around and smoke and joke around a fire pit and I've really liked that the most uh, about this because yeah. you don't do that around other girls you just don't Tina, I've got like? a two-part question. Uh -oh. All right, so when you first get your poiki, do you need to cure it with oil? Not only if you've got straight cast. So if you're going to get the kudu um, poiki, you do not need to cure it at all. That's so, like this. Yeah, you would want to season a standard um, Dutch oven, but you're not going to have nearly as beautiful a product if you just go ahead and get the kudu. It's perfect for, for any element. Is there anything special about deglazing in the poiki and you can you compare and contrast maybe the interior of the poiki to a standard cast iron Dutch oven? Well, you know, it's really more about the slope. This has the slope of like a walk um, at the bottom. So it's going to be a little bit different than your flat, um, say, lodge Dutch ovens and things of that nature. And in America, you, most of your Dutch ovens are very flat at the bottom. They've got those little stubs. What I do like about this kudu is that the longer legs, um, it allows more airflow, so you get a more of a consistent heat. Lots of times on those smaller Dutch ovens, you're ultimately stamping out your heat source at the bottom, and so this allows for a longer cook. Why don't you talk I, about the I really, glazing? I prefer on a deglaze, I really do like the enamel surface, because I'm a little, I mean, I'm really, I, mean, I don't think most people agree, the reason we're deglazing is because that's where there's a ton of flavor, and I want every single little morsel. So there's, at the time when we're deglazing, there's not much in the pan except for a few things. And I've got my wooden spoon or whatever, my flat spoon, and I'm hitting every single spot to make sure there's nothing left. So at the advantage of the enamel coated uh, cast iron is I've got the heat of the cast iron, but that smooth surface of the enamel, I'm leaving nothing behind. It's coming into the flavor uh, of, of my dish. That's right, and, and what you'll find like other dishes like this, the next day, these dishes are better because yeah. all those flavors have, have had time to sit in, soak in, concentrate together, and you just it just gets better. The leftovers are as good or better as the original dish. This is, I know, one other thing, these things are really easy to clean. Yeah, uh, the they're, enamels they're, are very easy to clean. I mean, once you've, you you got to, you know, get whatever's out of there, take some soft cloth, you don't want to use any, uh, you know, steel wool or anything. Uh, if something really is stuck on there, use some, you know, Bon Ami or, or, or Barkeeper's Friend, but they they clean up really easily. Okay, Tina, one more question. So we've got a question. Um, I haven't really foreseen this issue before, but uh, can uh, grease drip when rotating the grill surface off the heat? Any tips to reduce drippings? So when you're cooking on um, the grill, you obviously have uh, the, the food, the fat, whatever's cooking can drip through. So when I'm managing heat on the grill, I'm usually doing that straight up and down because I can reduce my temperature zone from 800 degrees at the bottom up to under 200 degrees at the top. I mean, we could leave our hands here all day and not have any issue, but we certainly wouldn't want to keep it down there. So if I've got something like a, you know, a fatty steak or hamburgers or something, I'm going straight up with that 
and I'm managing my temperature that way, I love to transfer, if I'm not using the plancha, those items into the plancha, then I absolutely don't have to worry about it dripping. The other thing that I do um, is I take, I'm on a wooden porch here. Um, I've got, you know, really affordable concrete pavers that I've spread around the bottom of my grill. And if there is any drip, um, if, if Kruger doesn't nab it before it hits the ground, um, it won't do a lot of damage and it won't make a mess. I mean, I wouldn't, I'm not someone that really wants to have a real messy area when I'm, I'm cooking. And I've managed my grill drip and grease by, you know, going up versus just swinging it out. Now, if I've got an issue where I need to get something off the fire, you might get an incident where you have some of that, but by and large, you can keep the, this area really clean. There's a dish that I make that's rather messy. It's Korean uh, bulgogi, and I use two grill surfaces, and, and I don't have anything else, just two grill surfaces. And when I'm cooking in other people's homes, I, I do that um, also on the side. I bring cardboard mm -hmm. so I don't mess up their pretty driveways and I just put it kind of around so that when it drips, it drips on the cardboard. Yeah, so if you're catering like Chris at someone's house and you want to not mess up their driveway, then get you some cardboard. But by and large, you can have the kudu at your home and keep your porch very yeah. clean, just for sure. Yeah. So yeah. just one other tip, uh, what I've done at my house is simply swing the plancha underneath the grill as it comes off and the plancha catches all the grease which i'm usually roasting vegetables which just adds to the dish so let's clarify that statement from tino for those of you that didn't hear it when tino's wife is cooking on the kudu grill <laughs> and she's about to He's swing it off this before. she's about to swing it off and potentially have some drip grease he will come over and slide the plancha under it um, before she serves him his delicious meal. But yes, that's a great suggestion, Tina. Thank you. All right, guys, we're going to wrap it up on that note. Uh, what a great first edition of Kudu TV. We're going to be doing some really exciting things in the future. We're going to be traveling around the country. We're going to be meeting with some excellent chefs um, and Kudu Bra Masters. We've got the Kudu Bro Master here who's done an Bro awesome Masters job. Bro Masters a promotion. Thank you for uh, chipping in and helping me out here. And I, I look forward that's to great. when we're here in Macon, um, Chris working with me. He does a great yeah. job. So um, that's it. That's all I have to say. Uh, thank you all for uh, being a part of this. And please join Kudu Nation.